All right, let's go. We're talking about the Holy Spirit, and we've talked about uh, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, and um, uh, we, we're, I want to get to this part here, which is sort of, oh yeah, this is what it is, descriptions of the Holy Spirit, and we want to just keep working through uh, uh, our, um, our biblical passages about the Holy Spirit. So this is our this is our goal and our um, and our hope for this uh, for this study here as well. So let me just adjust this. So the Holy Spirit description of though Himself invisible because spirit, this is one of the marks of spirits is invisibility. Uh, but the, uh, the the Holy and the Holy Spirit is especially then unvisible. Yet the Holy Spirit may appear in form and his activities may be described. So, um, so we have a couple of descriptions, and this will be fun. The first one we have here is the picture of the dove. And we remember this from uh, the baptism of Jesus, which is one of the most, most important um, texts for us to consider. So we have the baptism of Jesus, and we remember that the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove and rests on Jesus. So, uh, John confirms that as well. And this dove takes us back, we'll remember, to the ark where, uh, where um, uh, Noah put out the birds and half of them, uh, or what the raven didn't come back at all, but then the dove did and it had the olive branch. And so it brought back that gift of peace. So in the baptism of Jesus. So that's in uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, but let's just get the context and go back to verse 13. So here we are, gospel of Mar uh, Matthew, baptism of Jesus. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan, to John, to be baptized by him. But John would have prevented him saying, uh-oh, this happened again. I can't, there's a button that I press on this thing and it, it means that I can't stop writing and I can't ever, there we go. Okay. Sorry. It's like, it's like when your pin leaks, it's if I press a certain button on my little pin here, it just draws over. All right. Where were we? Jesus came from Gal from Galilee to Jordan, to John, to be baptized by him. Remember that Galilee, the lake was in the North, the Jordan river, uh, flowed south through the Jordan Valley. There, it flowed into the Dead Sea. There's the mountains are here, and Jerusalem's up here. There's Bethany beyond the Jordan, probably right down in here. So this region is the Galilee. So Jesus was in Galilee, and he comes. He comes probably down the Jordan to right here to be baptized by John. You can go and visit the place now. It's kind of cool. Okay, and John says, "No, no, 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 no. I, I, I can't baptize you." I need to be baptized by you. John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill, to fill up all righteousness. Now, this is a riddle that Jesus gives. And I want to tell you guys that, and this is a, a kind of funny story is that I, my very first sermon at seminary, which I can't believe that they assigned this. My very first sermon to preach in, in preaching 101 class was this text, the baptism of Jesus. And I think I spent about 80 hours on that sermon. It was, I've never spent uh, more time on a sermon than on that first sermon. And it was, uh, it was, it's hard to figure out, in fact, what Jesus is talking about here. We, we understand what John is saying. He looks at Jesus and he says, look, I'm baptizing for the forgiveness of sins, and you don't have any sins to be forgiven. So what are you doing coming over here to be baptized by me? You don't need this. I need to be, I need to be baptized by, by you. But then Jesus answers with this riddle and says, thus it's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So here's, here's how I thought of it then, and I still think of it the same way, Th this picture. Uh, of of what this means, the, bapt the baptism of Jesus. So let me just uh, get a little uh, blackboard here. 
Pastor Mitwitty in the waiting room. Woo. Okay, so if you can imagine a valley like this with hills on either side, and just imagine the rolling hills should have been green. And, uh, and then here's the river, the Jordan River kind of comes down here. And on the, on the side of the valley are a bunch of sheep over here, little sheeps. They're on the hills. But these sheep are not, these sheep are filthy. They're covered in filth and mud and dirt and spit. And they are just mangy looking, nasty sheep, just horrible looking. And one after another, here's John the Baptist in the, in the river. And one after another, these sheep go into the river, and then John puts them out on the other side, and they are white, fluffy, beautiful, cleansed sheep, whiter than any launderer could get them, just beautiful sheep over there, okay? And this is John baptizing in the Jordan. But then up to the edge of the river comes one sheep that's brighter than all the rest, just beautifully bright. And John says, why are you coming to be baptized by me? I, I should be baptized by you. You don't need this washing. You're, you are already clean. But Jesus says, permit it to be so now, for thus it's fitting for us to fill up all righteousness. And what happens is this, this is amazing. This sheep, this beautiful one, goes into the, into the river, and all of the filth from all of the other sheep is absorbed onto him. So that he now is covered in the sins of all of the other sheep. And this one now goes out on the other side, bearing all of the filth of all of the other sheep. And John points at him and says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So that, so that Jesus now in his baptism, and this is the first thing that we should know. What does Jesus' baptism mean? Jesus' baptism is his ordination. This is when he enters into the office of the Messiah or of the, of the Redeemer, the office of the Redeemer. And this is when he begins this work of bearing the sins of the world that he would complete when he died on the cross. And that's the best way I have of thinking about uh, of, of thinking about what this baptism of Jesus means in, in the Jordan River by John. And so he's filling up all righteousness because he is taking the sins of the world and carrying them himself. So notice, if you could just notice this picture here, that there's sin and then there's the sinless one. And on the other side now, there's the sinless ones and the sin. The sin has to go somewhere. God's justice has to go somewhere, but it goes on to Christ, his wrath on him instead of on us. Quite, quite wonderful. This is what we call the great, uh, the great exchange. Uh, I was reading uh, someone, one of you sent me um, this beautiful uh, essay on, on, um, the imputed righteousness in the ancient church. And this was important because I've been fighting with the, um, uh, with the Catholics online. And this is from this guy called Mathetes letter to Diogenitas, which is some ancient thing. We don't even know what it said, but it said he himself, Jesus took on him, the burden of our iniquities. He, the father gave his own son as a ransom for us, the Holy one for transgressors the blameless one for the wicked, the righteous one for the unrighteous, the incorruptible one for the corruptible, the immortal one for them that are mortal. For what other thing was capable of covering our sins than his righteousness? And by what 
other one was it possible that we, the wicked and ungodly, could be justified than by the only Son of God? Oh, sweet exchange. Oh, unsearchable operation. Oh, benefits surpassing all expectation that the wickedness of many should be hid in a single righteous one, and that the righteousness of one should justify many transgressors. That's just a, an amazing passage there. In fact, this passage, I think the best passage for this great exchange, someone, don't let me forget that we're talking about the baptism of Jesus here, but the, at the end of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, oh, look, it's already highlighted for us. <laughs> It says, for our sake, let's just get the pronoun, who the pronouns here. So for our sake, he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, Jesus Christ, to be sin, who knew no sin. So Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin, so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. So sin goes on to Jesus so that righteousness would come onto us. That's the great exchange. Oh, blessed exchange. Really beautiful. Okay. So, so that, that work uh, begins in the baptism of Jesus. Let's go back there. See if we can get there. Baptism of Jesus. Okay. So let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us, to fulfill all righteousness. Got it? And then he consented. So John said, okay. <laughs> I really think, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if John knew everything that was going on here. This is my, this is my, th just imagining John's reaction is he says, all right, you're the boss. Here you go. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. This is interesting to ask the question, what did Jesus see? What did John see? What did everybody else see? And you got to compare the, the uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke to track that down. That's a homework for you guys. And he, Jesus, saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So this is, so God, the father speaks. So we have, okay, what, what do we want to say about this? Let's do the Trinitarian stuff first, and then let's do the dove stuff next. So um, how marvelous to notice in the scriptures that the two most clear passages about the doctrine of the Trinity are connected to baptism. So we have a lot of doctrine, a lot of, a lot of, mm, a lot of passages in the scripture that talk about the Trinity, but the two clearest are this one, Matthew 3, where we have the we have Jesus in the water, and we have the, well, let me just draw the picture. I got to, so we have, we have Jesus there in the water, and we have heaven opened, and we have the Holy Spirit coming in the form of a dove, and we have the voice of God the Father. So that we have the, we have the Father We have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit all there at once. Really great. And then the second text on the doctrine of the Trinity, also in Matthew, is Matthew 28, where Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So that baptism is done in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, this is quite stunning that the baptism texts are the Trinity texts, 
And I think it's nice for us to think about this and to say, okay, so, you know, what, uh, what does this mean? What does it mean that baptism and the doctrine of the Trinity are connected to one another? And, and there's a lot in this reflection, but I think one of the, one of the clear, uh, what, how do, one of the things that we don't want to miss, one of the things that we can't miss is that in baptism, we are becoming part of this holy, of the holy family. So baptism is oftentimes spoken of in the, in the, with the language of adoption, salvation and adoption were adopted as his children. And so in baptism, when the Lord gives us his name and we're born again, remember John 3, 5, uh, Titus 3, 5, when we're born again in baptism and we get this new name, now we belong to the family of God. You are a child of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. So the language of, do- of adoption, the language of, so- of sonship, the language of, um, of family, all of this is wrapped up in the gift of baptism. So it's no accident that baptism and the doctrine of the Trinity are connected to one another. And we see it in the text because, because in the text, the Father is going to say to Jesus, well, to us, about Jesus, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. So um, what's the best way into this one? We have in the gospel, how about this? We have in the gospels three times where we hear the voice of God, the father. I don't know if that's a surprise to you. Or if, I don't know, maybe you've thought about this before, heard me talk about it or something. But when we we hear the Father's voice only only three times, number one here at the baptism of Jesus, number two at the transfiguration. Remember that... uh, Jesus is there. He's talking with Moses and Elijah and the cloud overshadows them and the disciples wake up and the God, the father says he speaks out of the cloud. And what does he say? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. So it's both times. It's, it's this. And then we have the third time that we hear the voice of God, the father, Oh, someone can remind me of the, of the text. I think it's in John 13. It's Monday, Thursday text. And Jesus is praying. Maybe it's Holy Week. Maybe it's not Monday, Thursday yet. Jesus is praying, Father, glorify your name. And God answers and he says, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. And that's speaking of the death of Jesus on the cross. So, so those are the three, the only three times that we hear the voice of God, the father, and all three times, all three, the father is pointing to the son. This is a, uh, a reference to Psalm two. You want to look at Psalm two? Okay. Let's look at Psalm two. Since you guys asked, I've been thinking a lot about Psalm two. In fact, I'm thinking about doing last week or a couple of weeks ago, I did a video on Psalm one and, um, uh, and now I've been working on Psalm two. And I think if I, if I just read the Psalm every day for a month, and then I might do a little grappling video on it. So I'm working on that. I'm reading Psalm two, uh, every day and, and I'm kind of working through it, but the, um, the voice of God, the father says, um, in Jesus baptism, this is my son. And he's quoting Psalm two. Now let's just, um, if I make this smaller, can you guys see it to show you the whole Psalm? Let me see how much I have to go down here to see the whole Psalm. 
that's too that's too small what can i do here what if i what if i do this and i make it into columns whoops ha okay now now here's all psalm 2 okay so let's just do a little bit of work on psalm 2 one of the questions we want to we want to ask is who's talking to who and so the the background of psalm 2 probably king david is we have the prophetic narrator uh, who's telling us um, uh, who's telling us who's talking to who? Okay, so this is our background of who's talking to who, the prophetic narrator. And then, oh, thank you. Joseph says that the the other the third text is John twelve twenty eight for the other time where. Uh, God the Father is talking. So thank you for that. Okay. So why did the nations rage? Why do the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds and cast away their cords from us. So, so here is the conversation. And this is maybe one of the main points of this Psalm 2 is here's the conversation of the earthly kings. Okay, and the question of the psalm is going to be, who's going to be the king? Is it going to be this king, or is it going to be these kings, or is it going to be this king? Okay, so uh, these kings or this king? So the rulers of the earth come together and they say, let us burst their bonds. Who are their bonds? Who's the there? That's Yahweh and his Messiah. So let's break the commandments. But there's a that so that's the earthly kings, but then there's a heavenly council. There's a conversation in heaven, and it sounds quite different. Now, we remember when we're asking the question, who is talking to whom? Uh, we got to be really careful on this, and we're gonna have because we have two conversations, verse six and verse seven, eight, and nine. Okay. And verse six, let's just see who it is. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Well, that is the words of the Lord. And he's talking about his anointed. And then let's do what color do we want for Jesus? And then the anointed is going to talk. And he's going to make a pronouncement as well. So this I is the voice of the anointed one, the Messiah. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me. So this is Jesus talking, and this is Jesus telling us what the Father said to him. <laughs> and so what did the Father say to Jesus? You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of, ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So what we, now just to think of what we have here is we have, we have David quoting Jesus, quoting God the Father, talking to Jesus. This is a this verse seven, eight, and nine is one of those glorious moments in the scripture where we hear how it is between the father and the son. So the father says to all of us, My king, I, I have put my king on Zion. That's Jerusalem. That's the tabernacle, my holy hill. And then the king, this king, says, I will tell of the decree when the Lord did this. I'll tell you how he set me on that hill. He said to me, you are my son. Today, I have begotten you. Now, there's a deep, deep, deep mystery in these words. Today, I have begotten you. We have this past tense, have begotten, and we have this present tense, today. And this becomes the mystery of the eternal begottenness of the son. So when is the son begotten? It happened. It, it's done 
today. It's, it's accomplished today. In other words, it's in eternity past. And this, the father will make the nations the son's heritage. The ends of the earth will be his possession so that you will break them with a rod of iron. This is the uh, oh, Revelation 12 text. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Okay. So these nations, that these kings, which are trying to burst the, they're, they're trying to burst the Lord's bonds and commandments. They're forgetting that the Lord has put his king on the holy hill. And so now the prophet David is going to go back to this business of kings and say, hey, you better be wise. You better serve the Lord with fear. You better, look at this phrase, rejoice with trembling, which is a wild phrase. Normally, these two things don't go together. Trembling goes with fear, not with rejoicing. But here, this is, this is, this is faith. Uh, rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son. That, and this means to honor the son as king lest he be angry, angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Look at how much wrath there is in this text. Whoops. Wrath is there. Uh, wrath is there. Um, the rod of iron. So this is this wrath. So there's this, we got to look out for the, we don't want to be on the wrath side of this king. We want to be on the refuge side of this king. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. This is an interesting thing. I was thinking about this a little bit. This and side note is that is Psalm 1 started with blessing and it started about the way conversation now. Psalm 2 ends with those. I think there's a I think there's a parallel between Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. But that I'll leave that for you guys to sort out. So here is the text that God the Father is quoting. Uh, and in the baptism of Jesus. And it's this eternal begottenness of the son that's the son office and then the father takes the son and makes him the king the anointed the messiah okay okay so back to uh back to Saul to uh uh, uh where were we matthew chapter three all of this because we want to see the Holy Spirit as the dove. <laughs> That's what we're doing, right? <laughs> so you guys got to make sure you keep me on track, although so far we failed. Uh, what's going on here? No temptation of Jesus. Okay, so this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Now, here's the, here's the payout on this. When Psalm 2, Jesus is the beloved son, but, but when we hear this voice connected to baptism, what we realize is that not only does God the Father say this uniquely to his son, the only begotten one in eternity, but also now in our own baptism, this is what God the Father says to us, or at least something like it, that we are his beloved children. And that he is well pleased with us. I don't know how. Um, the. We, I, I was talking with a couple the other day, um, you know, for pre marriage stuff. We always do um, Genesis 1, 2, 3. And then we do Matthew 19, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And then we do Ephesians, we do Ephesians 5, where Paul says, wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives. And then at the end, he kind of sums it up. He says, so let the wife see that she respects her husband and let the husband see that he loves her wife. He loves his wife. And I always do this sort of survey. Maybe I'll do this survey now. If, if a husband or a wife, if you could have just love or respect. Now, now, I understand that you can't have, those two can't ever be separated from one another. But if you could just have love or respect, what would it be? And you guys can respond in the chat. But my experience has been that probably 90% of the, of the eaves say, I would rather have love. And about when it comes to the atoms, 
it's about 50, 50, 50 percent love, 50 percent respect. And I know for me anyways, that there's been those times where, you know, Carrie says that she loves me, which is great uh, all the time. But then there's been a handful of times where she said, you know, Brian, I'm proud of you. And, and I feel like I could lift a car above my head. <laughs> you know, that I'm proud of you. That really, that really, that kind of, that's love hitting you from a different angle. It kind of sneaks up on you. And, um, and I, this is what God, the father is saying to Jesus. I'm pleased with you. I'm proud of you. You make me happy. And I think it's really quite amazing to, to for us to hear that as well, for the Lord to come along and say, I'm pleased with you. I'm proud of you. Not because of what we've done or what we've accomplished, but this is the this this is a gift of God's grace that He comes to us and He treats us not according to our sin, but according to His kindness in Christ. Okay, now to the dove. What's going on with the dove here? The Holy Spirit could have come uh, down in the form of anything, I suppose. We might expect the Holy Spirit to come down in the form of what fire that would be my first expectation or a, a, a pillar of cloud like he did in the wilderness or uh, something else um but he doesn't he takes the form of a dove and this takes us right back to the flood and we remember that noah was on the ark looked like this i've never been to the ark encounter i'd like to go over there sometime if any of you have been on the ark uh encounter that'd be great let us know what you think about it there's always the giraffe you know sticking out the edge of the ark and here's old noah and he sends out the raven and it just flies around never comes back sends out the dove comes back sends out the dove a third time and the dove comes back and the dove has in its you will remember it has in its uh, mouth an olive branch. And Noah knows that the ground has, the, the water has receded, that the Lord has been gracious and he's kept his promises. And so, and so this becomes the, uh, the indication of peace, that the Lord will keep his promises, that he'll never again, um, he'll never again destroy the earth with water. In fact, the next time the destruction comes, it won't be with water. It will be with fire. So here's Jesus in the Jordan River being baptized by John, his cousin, and he comes up out of the water and the dove comes out. The Holy Spirit comes out in the form of a dove and rests on him. And this indicates now that Jesus has come to bring peace. It's amazing. It comes to bring peace. Uh, it's Peter who tells us, 1 Peter 3, that says, um, that says that baptism is a type, uh, sorry, the ark is a type of baptism. And this comes into the beautiful flood prayer that Luther wrote, where he says, you drowned hard-hearted Pharaoh in the sea, and yet you brought your people Israel through the water on dry ground, foreshadowing this washing of holy baptism, in which our flesh is destroyed, and the new man is risen. Now, how amazing is it then? So the Holy Spirit comes in Christ to bring peace. How, <clears throat> excuse me. how amazing is it that as soon as this kind of peace is declared from heaven, I mean, can you imagine a dove flying out of heaven, flying from the throne of God? This is not, this is not fire and brimstone coming from heaven. This is not the angel of death coming from heaven. This is not hail and 10 plagues coming from heaven. This is a dove coming from heaven. The Lord is declaring peace. In him we have peace. And then Jesus is led by the Spirit to do battle in the wilderness. It's kind of an amazing connection that's there. Okay, so the Holy Spirit comes in the form of a dove. Uh, Krista says, was this right? No, uh, Joan says 
the cooing sound of doves in my yard often makes such a comforting sound, almost a loving sound. So the Holy Spirit comes to rest in Jesus. This should be, this is a very pious idea, Joan, is that whenever we hear, um, when, whenever we, whenever we hear the sound of a dove, we remember the, the kindness of God in Christ. So that's good. Uh, okay. Any questions about the dove? I didn't know we were going to spend so much time on that. I guess we got to wander around. We got to go look at Psalm two. We got to check everything else out. If you got dove questions, let me know. Here's the next one. I can't believe it's 1040. Um, wind or breath. And this is going to go together with fire. So let's take these two together. Now, you'll see the same word here uh, in Hebrew, and this is also the same word in Greek, breath, wind, and spirit. In Hebrew, the word is ruach. I think you go like this. Is that in Hebrew? It's I'd like into English is something like this. Uh, ruach. Uh, maybe there's a C in there. I can't remember. In Greek, it's panoima. Pen, e, e, in, uh, pen, is there an N in there? Good goodness. Uh, something like that. Pneuma, I think is a uh, pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit. Or pneumonia has to do with your breathing, right? I better erase this. That's kind of embarrassing. But the same word, the point is the same word uh, for, uh, means both or all breath and wind and spirit, all three at the same time. Okay, so Pentecost is going to be our big Holy Spirit coming day. And so it says when the day of Pentecost arrived, remember Pentecost is the only Jewish festival that's sort of carried into the church, but it means something very different arrived. They were all together in one place, upper room, probably the house of Mark in Jerusalem. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Oh, here's the Greek for us. A mighty rushing wind so that this wind comes along and uh and and it's going to be an indication of the holy spirit and it filled the entire house where they were sitting like a little mini hurricane and then divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them and they were all filled with the holy spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So this is Pentecost, and we have the Holy Spirit coming in these different forms, the form of wind, the sound of the wind, and the shape of fire. Now, this wind reminds us of John 3. Remember the visit of Nicodemus to Jesus at night, and Jesus says, you must be born again. You must be born of water and the Spirit. And then Jesus says, the Spirit blows where it wills, you don't know where it came from. You don't know where it's going, but you hear the sound of, of him, him, spirit, it, wind. Uh, sometimes I think most English versions say in John 3, uh, wind, don't they? They don't say spirit. It could, I think it's better to translate it as spirit. And so this is that, that promise is fulfilled. Here comes the sound of the wind. And then this divided tongues of fire on top of them. So that you have the, 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 the Holy Spirit is indicating what he's doing. He's coming in the form of a tongue, a fire, because he's coming to preach. Now, I think it'll be good enough at this point to, to simply maybe say a quick word about tongues, and then we might loosen things up for conversation here as well. But what, what we want to end the coming of the Holy Spirit, because here, one of the main things that I've been seeing in our study of the Holy Spirit is that, um, is that the Holy Spirit comes um, in connection to the, in, in different ways, in connection to our office. And we've made this point here before, but so the Spirit comes to Christians, and what's the result? We say, no one can say Jesus is Lord, 
but by the Holy Spirit, so that the Holy Spirit comes and we have faith, and then the Holy Spirit comes with his fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and this is the common possession of the Spirit by all Christians, okay? The Holy Spirit also comes connected to our office. And that's especially what's happening here. Oftentimes, when it uses the language of being filled with the Holy Spirit, this is in connection to a particular office. And here the office is, is preaching. So that the Holy Spirit comes, and the result is that these apostles begin to preach, and here they get to preach in a supernatural way. They get to preach to all the people who are visiting Jerusalem from all these different places, and they get to, um, uh, to preach them without knowing their languages, so that we have this, um, the, the great gift of tongues, which we see four times in the book of Acts, so that, uh, but this, it doesn't have to be the preaching office. It can be for all these other offices, but it's especially the preaching office for which the Holy Spirit comes. So we have, um, we saw it in the baptism of Jesus, when he was ordained as the Messiah, we see it still in ordination. When a pastor is ordained, you pray that the Holy Spirit would come upon him. Now, I always want to go to the ordination, and I was just think of the kids that are sitting in the back, and they watch, you know, here goes, here we call this guy to be our pastor, and he walks up to the front, and he's standing there in front of everybody else, and here's the preacher standing up with him, and he puts his hands on him, and he says, and he says, come Holy Spirit. And the, the kid sitting there in the pew says, uh, says to his dad, hey, we should have called the pastor who has the Holy Spirit already. <laughs> you know, why are we saying come Holy Spirit? Doesn't he have the Holy Spirit already? But so the same thing is true here for the apostles. Didn't they have the Holy Spirit already? Jesus breathed on them on Easter, gave them the Holy Spirit. They were already baptized. They were Christians. They confessed Jesus as Lord. They had the Holy Spirit as Christians, but now the Holy Spirit is coming upon them to equip them for the particular office, okay? And so that's what's going on here, and that's an indication about why the Holy Spirit comes here, in this case, in, um, in, the, form of a, in the form of these tongues of fire above their heads, because he's going to open their mouths, set their tongues to the work of preaching, okay? So, and this is maybe important for us, especially in our own day, because one of the dangers of those people who, um, who really emphasize the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the Pentecostals, uh, one of the things that they do is that they come along and they, and, and they, they try to divide the Holy Spirit from office. In fact, they see the Holy Spirit as taking you away from vocation rather than supporting you in the particular vocation and calling that you've been given. That's one of the dangers that we got to look out for. So here the Holy Spirit comes in the form of tongues of fire and of wind. All right, right on. I'm look, I, I, it's, uh, it's 1048. Let me, um, let me uh, check to see if you guys have any questions about this in particularly. It seems like there's some stuff happening. And I think we, I might say a prayer to end our sort of official thing here, and then we'll loosen things up and have some questions. I've been, my phone has been going nuts uh, all through the study, so I might end a couple of minutes early this morning just because I think there's probably something going on that I need to give my attention to. But let me um, just check where... I think we're okay in the chat. I don't see any questions going. So let's close in prayer, and then we'll have a little more conversation. Oh, Lord, we give you thanks that you have set apart your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, as your Messiah and as your King on your holy hill, the Savior of all the world. We pray that we would find refuge in him. We thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to set him apart for this great work of redemption and salvation. And we thank you that in baptism, you also take away our sins and make us part of your own family. We pray that you would continue to send your Holy Spirit to us, to fill us for the work that you've set in front of us. 
uh, the vocations that you've given to us, that we would go about this work with joy and peace through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Remember, before we shut it down, to go to your pastor's Bible class this week. God be praised.